had some excellent singing tonight. I grew up in a congregation in Georgia where all the women sang alto very loudly and very well. And I got used to good alto singing. And when I moved away from Georgia, um, I haven't been in a congregation that had strong altos since. I miss that a lot. It's good to hear the altos particularly tonight. It's wonderful to sing. I'll try to explain a little bit if you can read my handwriting on the board. What we have going on here, I want to kind of give you a structure of what we're looking at this evening, explain why I have it arranged the way that we do. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that he needs to have interpreted to him, and so he calls unto him Daniel to explain the dream. When you get over to Daniel chapter 7, Daniel is now the one having the dream, and his dream is parallel to the one that Nebuchadnezzar had. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is an earthly perspective of what's going on, and Daniel's dream is the same scene from a heavenly perspective. When you get up to Daniel chapter 3, in Daniel 3 you have the three Hebrews tribe because they refused to bow down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. When you get over to Daniel chapter 6, you have Daniel being tried because he is refusing to give up worship to the one true God. These two scenes have many parallels between them, just as chapters 2 and chapter 7 did. In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is judged by the God of heaven, and he humbles himself, and his life is spared. Yet, when we get over to Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar, his grandson, is tried as well, but this time the verdict comes in guilty and his life is taken from him. Those are the six parts we're working with. After we've gone through each scene, we'll talk about how they fit together better and some of the major points that you're supposed to get across from the overall big picture view. We begin in Daniel chapter 2 where Nebuchadnezzar has this vision of this great idol. This great image is in before him. He calls in all his wise men, all his magicians, the soothsayers, and he says, okay, I had this dream last night, but I want you to interpret it for me. And they said, sure, we'd be happy to do that. Just go ahead and tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. He says, no, it's not how it's going to work today. You tell me the dream, and if you can tell me the dream, I will believe you when you start telling me what it means. But if you can't tell me what my dream was, first of all, I don't believe you can interpret it. And they begin to fret and weary because... Uh, he has told them that he will put them to death if they cannot perform this. They feel like Nebuchadnezzar is being a little bit unfair with them until Daniel steps forth and meets the challenge. Daniel goes and he prays to the God of heaven who was the giver of the dream. God gave the vision. He can certainly interpret the vision. And that's what Daniel receives is a confirmation of the dream itself and also what it meant. He says, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you had this dream and you saw this great image. The head of gold art thou. The head of gold represented the Babylonian Empire. It was a world-dominant, very lavish and rich, the richest of all world empires, ruled by Nebuchadnezzar. He was the greatest leader in the world. But the second part of the statute, the arms and the chest of silver, indicated that the kingdom was not always going to re reside with the Babylonians. It was going to pass from them to the Medes and to the Persians. The Medes and the Persians would again rule the world, but they wouldn't be quite as lavish and extravagant in their reign as was Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Like Babylon, though, the Medes and the Persians would also pass by the way as well, and they would be replaced by the Grecian Empire. The Grecian Empire was described in the vision as having thighs of bronze. They were a much stronger, mightier nation led by Alexander the Great. They didn't have all the wealth and expense of either Babylon or the Medes and the Persians, but they were more powerful. And very quickly, at a very young age, Alexander the Great conquered the world. Yet his kingdom would not last. It would be divided amongst his generals. And after the Grecian Empire would come the Roman Empire. Described as the feet of uh, iron, uh, the legs of iron, and the feet partially of iron and partially of clay. They were the least wealthy of the group, but they were by far the strongest and the most fierce. This is the vision that Nebuchadnezzar has had. Thou, Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the head of gold, and here are the nations that are coming after you. This is an amazing 
prophecy because it was hundreds of years in advance. At this time, you can rightly say, well, Nebuchadnezzar, he's the greatest ruler in the world. He is the most wealthy. He is like a golden head. That's true. That doesn't take much prophetic insight. But to predict that he would pass away and so would his kingdom, and the one that replaced him would be replaced by another, which would be replaced by another way outside your lifetime, can only come by the direction of God. By the way, that's why a lot of people want to try to discredit the time period when Daniel was written. They want to say Daniel was written close to the, uh, the 100 B.C. And the reason they want to do that is because it takes away the concept of predictive prophecy. There's too much evidence that that was not the case. Daniel prophesied this far in advance. And then he says, notice what the Bible says in verse 34. Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, these kingdoms are representing this great image, but there comes this stone cut out without hands that strikes the image at its feet, and all subsequent kingdoms are crushed ground to powder, and then scattered to the winds of the earth, never to be known of anymore. This is a vision that troubles Nebuchadnezzar. What's the significance of the stone cut without hands? Images are made by man. All throughout the Bible, idolatry was condemned where images were crafted by man's hands, by man's ingenuity. That's the concept of world government or the kingdoms of men. Men form them, they craft them, they legislate laws, they dictate, they rule. They form them of their own wisdom and ingenuity. However, there is coming this stone cut out without hands. In other words, it is of divine origin. This was not the conception of mankind. It was divine. God made this stone and he hurls this stone against this image. That tells us there's a conflict between God and the kingdoms of men. When this, image, when this image is struck by the rock, the rock crushes it to powder. That means that God is going to triumph over these nations. It's going to look like these nations are powerful and they can't be touched. But God is going to strike them with this stone. And then this stone is quite miraculous. It's unlike any other stone because after it strikes the image, it begins to grow. And it grows and grows until it is an exceeding mountain that fills the entire world. Now what's going on here? Notice what the Bible says in verse 44. As Daniel interprets the image of the stone. And in the days of these kings. This is the last kingdom. The Roman Empire. In the days of these kings. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Which shall never be destroyed. Now listen to that. God is coming in the days of the final kingdom. And he will set up his kingdom. That will never be destroyed. He goes on, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. This is God's plan. It is going to happen just like I've said it, and nothing is going to keep it from happening. God is going to hurl his stone, his kingdom, at the kingdoms of men, crush them, and grind them to power. And then he will reign forever. This imagery and this language is picked up in the New Testament, so we're not left with questions about the kingdom of God, when and where it was established. Thank you. That passage we're familiar with, maybe we don't realize the connection to this passage, but Matthew chapter 16. On this occasion, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I'll just give you a clue here. We won't talk about the Son of Man, because that comes from Daniel's dream in Daniel 7. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? As Jesus is asking the question, he's also giving the answer as well. I know who 
I am. I'm the one that God foresaw coming in the world. But who do men say that I am? They say, well, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist or one of the prophets. We know you're a prophet. Everybody recognizes you're a prophet. You come preaching repentance. But which prophet we, you are, we're not sure. So Jesus, who do you say that I am? To which Peter says, thou art the Christ, or in other words, the anointed of God or the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responds, he says, Thou art Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Is that? Upon this rock I will build my church. Where do we get the concept of the rock coming from? This is coming from Daniel, where the Son of Man is, and where the rock, the stone, is cast at the image. Jesus is the stone. Now I'll take this imagery just a little bit further. When you get over the last book of the Bible in Revelation, I want you to notice how this is described. Jesus had said in Matthew 16, on this rock I will build my church. And yet now in Revelation chapter 21, he's describing his people. He says, verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Now notice carefully, he says, I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. But what does he see? And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city. So he said, I want to show you the bride, but he takes him to a mountain. And he shows him a city up on top of that mountain. And he describes this mountain, this city, as the bride of Christ. He says, he carried me away the city to the high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and the twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Do you notice what's being described here in this picture? This picture, this mountain, and this city on top of the mountain is the bride of Christ. He says there's a light within this city that's extremely bright and brilliant. Whenever you see that, you ought to remember the bright light upon Mount Sinai when God appeared there in the Shekinah glory as he delivered the Ten Commandments to Moses. You ought to think about that bright, bright, great light that filled the tabernacle and the temple when God came to dwell amongst Israel. The great light indicated God's presence with his people. Here we are, we're back with the mountain representing the bride of Christ, his people, and there's this great light. God is dwelling with his people again. It has these gates to the north, the south, the east, and the west. This indicates that people from all over the world were welcome to come and dwell on the mountaintop in the city of God's people. They have the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel on the gates of this city, indicating this is where God's people dwells. This is the mountain of the Lord, where God dwells with his people, and they worship him continually day and night. What is it? The kingdoms of men have been destroyed, and what we have left is a mountain filled with people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, and they are referred to as the bride of Christ, the mountain of God, the city, the holy Jerusalem. This is what Daniel had envisioned and is coming about in glorious forms. One of the things that you should take away from Daniel 2 in a big picture view, do not place your confidence in the kingdoms of men. A lot of people get wrapped up in worrying about what's going on with our government, what's happening with our nation. How is it that we can enact change through our government and our society? Have you registered to vote? Are you going to vote in the upcoming election? We need to make sure we're putting the right man on. Don't worry about what's going on in the kingdoms of men. Because Daniel 2 is teaching, God reigns over the kingdoms of men, and what matters is his kingdom, not the kingdoms of men. 
His stone is coming to crush the kingdoms and to last forever. And it does not matter about the kingdoms that come and go from an earthly perspective. I want you to notice too. Second of all, the kingdoms of men are judged in Daniel 2. They don't want to be judged. They don't like that. They don't like having their power stripped from them. They don't like being crushed and blown to the winds never to be remembered. What's happening? God reigns and his kingdom is going to last. Now, people don't like that. They don't like his kingdom. They don't like that he has hurled it at the kingdoms of men. But it has happened nonetheless and God reigns. If you're here tonight, you're not a member of his kingdom. You need to think twice about that. You need to understand what Daniel is saying, that the kingdoms of this earth will be judged. Whose side will we be on? I think about the Lord's words in Matthew 21, verse 43. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. He's using that Daniel 2 language. You can try to resist the Lord and his kingdom, but at the end of the day, you will either break or it will grind you to power. That's a somewhat sobering and frightening thought if you're opposed to Christ, but it is quite uh, secure and encouraging if you are part of his kingdom. You go on from, da from Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar had that dream, and he goes, it's not coincidental that in the very next chapter, he starts building an image. This image would have been 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. This is quite an image. And he makes the whole thing gold. Now, Daniel told him the head's gold. But Nebuchadnezzar gets it in his mind. I am the head of gold. And I'll just make the whole image gold. I'll abide forever. He begins thinking of himself in ways contrary to what God has already revealed. Not only this, he's going to make a test of loyalty amongst his subjects. He gathers together all of his governors, all of his satraps, all of his administrators, and he's going to have a test of loyalty. Now, in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are elevated within the land as governors because they are loyal to their God. And when you read Daniel chapter 1, you think, oh, this is God bestowing blessings upon these people. He's blessing them above everybody else, raising them to situations of government. If I were in that day, I would want to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, raised up for glory as God's representative, his representative as his remnant. But then you get over to Daniel chapter 3, and because God raised them up, now they're on trial. And we would start thinking, well, I don't know that I'd want to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, I might, would rather be someone who had been uh, kind of forgotten about in this scene. They were raised up for moments of trial for this particular moment. You might ask in chapter 3, where's Daniel? We'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about Daniel a little bit later on. But right now, it's, the focus is on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they represent the faithful remnant. Now the decree goes out. That I've erected this statute, and when you hear all types of mixed instruments playing music, I want you to bow down and worship the idol that I have built. So we're going to test your loyalty to the kingdom. Now, to put this in perspective, this would be like getting called before a congressional hearing over which the President of the United States resides. You are questioned as to whether you are going to be faithful and loyal to America, or if you are going to be a traitor. And there is going to be swift judgment enacted. If you will not worship the God of this nation, then you will be immediately put to death. And by the way, it's going to be televised on national TV. <clears throat> that would be incredible pressure. I don't know how I would respond in a moment such as that. I don't like confrontation a whole lot. Can't be avoided in life. If you try to avoid all your life, you're... You don't have all kinds of problems. I don't go looking for a fight. I get nervous. I can imagine I'd be squeamish. My stomach would be tied in some knots as I was drugged before. But that's not what we see of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When all the music starts playing, everybody's looking at these three men, and they do not bow. And everybody goes running off to tell Nebuchadnezzar, 
These three Hebrews that you raised up, they ain't bound. And Nebuchadnezzar is furious, so he calls them in before him, and he says, look, we're going to do this one more time. You get one shot. When you hear the music, you bow down in worship, or I will throw you in the fire. I want you to notice the words that they speak to him in verse 16. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. When I was in high school, I played ball with a bunch of homeschoolers. They were all of a religious background, and they liked the fact that we believed in the Bible. We were a Bible-worshipping folks until we were in baseball tournament. It's at the end of the year. We're playing the Baseball World Series, and they don't understand why I'm not going to play baseball on Lord's Day morning. So oh, you can come down. We're going to have a worship service right before we have the game. And I said, no, we won't be there. They said, well, George, just go home and pray about this. And he says, I don't have to pray about this. I already know what God has written, and he ain't changed his mind, nor is he going to speak to me today. That's essentially what these three Hebrews are saying. They're saying, we don't have to get back to you on this. We don't have to pray about it. We will not bow down. And if that means you throw us in the fire, throw us. Our God will deliver us. And even if he don't, we will not bow down. Now they haven't received any message from God about whether he would deliver them or not. When they state this, they are trusting in their God one way or the other, come what may. Either we die and God gets the glory, or he saves us and he gets the glory. Either way, God is glorified. And he has put us in this moment so that he can be glorified. Now, this is not a story that's teaching you that if you will stand up for God, you will be saved regardless of what you think may happen. No. They didn't know if they'll be saved or not. God does save them because he had a message to send to the king and to the whole world. But mind you, had they died, God would still have received glory. Whether we live or whether we die, we are here to worship our God what man. Nebuchadnezzar is so enraged, he heats up the furnace way more than it was ever intended to be. And then I feel sorry a little bit for the two soldiers that throw him in because they died, and they had to die to show that this was a real deal. Nebuchadnezzar throws them in there, and he is watching, and he says, what's going on here? Because we threw three men in, our two soldiers died, we threw three men in, and now there's four. We're trying to kill them, and there, there's more coming out. And behold, the fourth one, he looks like a son of the gods. Later, this fourth individual would be referred to as the angel of the Lord. And I would argue with you that this is the second person of the God in pre incarnate. All throughout the Old Testament, you see a particular special angel of the Lord who appears in the burning bush. He appears to Joshua before the Isis took place. On some very rare occasions, it appears that God has come down. And on this occasion, God, the second person, we would refer to him as the Son, but this is before he was the Son, incarnate. He's standing there with these three Hebrews, and they are unsinged. What's happened? The kingdoms of this world are trying the faithful remnant, and God assures, he places his seal upon them, and claims them as his own and puts the world on notice as to who reigns in the affairs of mankind. In the next chapter, in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is having another dream. It's pretty call for. You're going to call for Daniel, the one who can interpret the dreams. This is more like a nightmare. The first dream, it's not clear if Nebuchadnezzar first remembered it. And if he did remember it, he's not exactly terrified about it. But here he's terrified. What's the dream? Whenever Daniel sees the dream and he has the vision that God grants him, he himself is trembling. 
Because this is a scene of judgment. This reminds me of the scene where Samuel, as a young boy, is called in before Eli, the high priest, and he has to tell Eli that you're going to die and so are your sons because your sons have been wicked. He didn't want to be the relayer of that message. Here Daniel is going before the most powerful king in the world to relay a nightmare. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream about this tree that grew up, and it was the largest tree in the world. Birds came and nested in its branches, and oxen would come, and they would sit underneath its, bra its branches in the cool shade. But then all of a sudden, an axe shows up and chops the tree down. And you realize at the end of the dream, the greatness of this tree has been judged. What's the significance of it? Daniel informs him that he is the tree. He's been the great ruler in all the world. His kingdom has been the grandest. All the nations have flocked to Babylon. They have all received blessing from Babylon. But Babylon is coming to an end. It's going to be cut down by God. This imagery is used in a unique way in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, you have the parabolic discourse where there are eight parables. And right in the center of that discourse, in verse 31, the Bible says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. What's going on here? Jesus is using the imagery from Nebuchadnezzar's nightmare. He's saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you were the great tree. All the birds came and nested in your branches, but God cut you down. Why? Because the kingdom of God rules over the kingdom of men. Now Jesus is displaying, he is revealing to them secrets about his kingdom, and he's saying, my kingdom is going to be great, and it's going to fill the world. It's going to be greater than Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom ever was. It's going to start out real small, it's going to look insignificant when it starts, but it's going to grow to where it's not just an herb anymore, it is a magnificent tree that fills the earth the birds come and nest in its branches, only this time it ain't coming down. The kingdom will endure forever because it is God's kingdom. As mighty and powerful as earthly kingdoms come, their days are limited and they are judged. Yet God's kingdom endures forever. After this dream is interpreted to Nebuchadnezzar, he goes out and loses his mind. God put him out to pasture. His hair grew so long as like an eagle's hair, his eagle's feathers. His fingernails became like bird's claws, and he ate grass for seven years, for seven times. Did you imagine President Trump losing his mind living in a field like a cow for seven years, and then after it was over, getting up and going back to being president. That'd be pretty incredible. And yes, what Nebuchadnezzar did. That's how influential and mighty of a worldly leader he was. That he could lose his mind for seven years, inflicted by God, and yet he could come back from it and still rule the world. Yet he was a changed man. In Daniel chapter 4, the chapter begins and it ends with a song of praise that he is giving the God of heaven. He got introduced to him back in chapter 2. He had a vision of him in chapter 3 as he saw some of the remnant remaining faithful and saved. And here, he is judged because he has exalted himself to a position of God. But after God makes it clear, you're not God, he got the message and he changed glorify God. Nebuchadnezzar was a smarter individual than Pharaoh was because after ten warnings, Pharaoh still didn't get it and he got put down. Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson and he humbled himself. The king of the world, the king of the greatest kingdom in the world was humbled and he recognized 
who the judge of the world was. But his grandson didn't learn the lesson. That's Belshazzar, chapter 5. <clears throat> Belshazzar was arrogant like his grandfather, only on a much more exceeding level. He's not only going to worship his gods, he's going to bring in all of his wives, all of his concubines, and he's going to worship in this idolatrous worship service, including feasting and drinking and probably all kinds of wicked, perverse activity, while his kingdom is under attack from the Medes and the Persians. He should have known that when the Medes and the Persians start showing up, you get nervous because God already said they're coming to tear you down. But he didn't learn the lesson from his grandfather. When they show up, he begins feasting and worshiping his idols, and he goes a step too far. And then he goes and takes the items that used to belong in Israel's temple, and he brings them out, sacred, holy, sanctified emblems, and he begins using them in his drunken feast. And when everybody's good and drunk and they're laughing it up, there appears this hand, and it starts writing on the wall. And everybody sobers up real quick and they are terrified at the vision they have beheld. Somebody needs to interpret what's going on. So we're going to go back to Daniel, who's the interpreter of visions and dreams. Daniel chapter 5, verse 22. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. He said, look, you're his son. Actually, it's his grandson. The Bible uses son to speak of sons and grandson. He says, you knew all about your grandfather, but you are too proud. You, won't, you didn't learn a lesson from it. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Well, pause there. Who are they worshiping? They're worshiping the God of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Those are the, that's the materials that made up the great image. They're still worshiping these false gods. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and the writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written, Mini, mini, tekel, you farasim. This is the interpretation of each word, mini. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Get this point. Belshazzar, he didn't want to see it, he didn't want to believe it, but it was forced upon him as the Medes and the Persians came in under his wall and killed him that very night. God rules over the kingdoms of men. And whether they want to acknowledge him or not, he still rules nonetheless. And history goes according to his dictate. Daniel chapter 6. The new kingdom is in place, the Medes and the Persians. What we are seeing in the book of Daniel itself is what is predicted in chapter 2 is fulfilled when we get over here to chapter 5. Now, if Daniel could predict that the Babylonian kingdom was going to be replaced by the Medo-Persian kingdom, who would have ever thought that? If that came true... Should we not start considering that the rest of his prophecy will come true as well? Daniel 6. Under Nebuchadnezzar, the three Hebrews were tried. And now under the Medes and the Persians, Daniel is tried. Now, a question brethren ask me sometimes, they, they ask this question, they say, where's Daniel in chapter 3 when the three Hebrews are being tried? Well, you could ask the same question from Daniel 6. When Daniel's being tried here, where are the three Hebrews? I don't believe that, that it was one, you know, one group was missing at the time, or one group didn't have faith at the time. I think what's happening is we're having a limited, specific view that the writer wants us to see. Here, in chapter 3, 
These three individual Hebrews, they represent the remnant of God, whereas in chapter 6, Daniel is the representative of God. When these four characters are introduced to us in Daniel chapter 1, there's a distinction made between them. They're all raised up, but Daniel is given special focus and special attention. He is given the ability to interpret dreams and visions. He's always the guy who's coming in to give God's message, his revelation. He is God's special representative amongst the remnant. Okay. Here's what we're seeing. As the representative is persecuted, so were the people. One goes with the other. If you attack the leader, you are attacking the people. If you attack the people, you are attacking the leader. Daniel, the representative of God, is now under attack, and God will glorify himself once again. Do you realize the, the kind of the similarity, but the distinction as well? In chapter 3, the th three Hebrews, they were commanded to bow down and worship an idol. And they refused to do that rightfully so. And we will look at that and we say, you know, we would do the same thing. We are not going to bow down and worship a false god. In chapter 6, Daniel's not asked to bow down and worship a god. What he's asked to do is for 30 days not to worship at all. Now, I know that's a weird concept that you've never heard of before. The government asking you not to worship for a period of time. You know what this is saying? Failing to give God the worship that's due him is the same as bowing down to his rival. Now, we don't think of it in those terms. Sometimes we could justify ourselves and we could say, well, for a period of time, we just won't worship. Now, we're not going to bow down to false gods, but we just won't worship. And we think, you know, God wouldn't want us to to be persecuted, and so for a time, we won't, we won't dishonor him, but we just won't serve him. We just won't worship him like he has asked us to worship him. It won't work. When the king says, you don't worship, Daniel does what he has done all of his life. He goes into his room, he opens his windows towards Jerusalem, and he bowed up, bows down to pray. You know, you, you think, well, Daniel, you could have gone in your closet and prayed. That's how Daniel prays. Why is Daniel doing this? Daniel is in captivity, and according to Daniel chapter 9, he knows captivity is almost over. He's praying toward Jerusalem because that's the city where the temple used to be. That's his homeland. That's where his people are. He realizes he is in covenant relationship with God. And he is praying to his covenant God. And even though he realizes Exodus is soon, he's not going to try to get there on his own terms. And so he is bowing down at what had to be a very difficult moment. I think sometimes we overlook how difficult of a prayer this had to be. Because Daniel doesn't know what's going to take place. All he knows is that he worships and he serves his God. His covenant God. And as he prays, the people go running off to tell the king just like they had run off and told the king when the three Hebrews would not bow down. The king is sorry, for he likes Daniel, but we might say he didn't have enough backbone in the moment to save Daniel. He concedes to his governors and his rulers who have conspired. I want to ask you, why, why are they treating Daniel this way? There's two reasons. Number one, because Daniel is righteous, and they are wicked, wicked men, and wicked men always hate the righteous. That's how it has always been. There's the seed of the woman, there's the seed of the servant, and they will always be in conflict throughout the history of the world. 
They hate him because he is right. They have tried and tried and tried to find dirt on this man, and they can't find it. Now, we're coming up. This is election year. And in, in a matter of months, you won't hear about COVID anymore, and they'll quit rioting in the streets. And there's going to be so much mud slung around on presidential candidates that you won't know a clean individual if they walk, walk, walked up and shook your hand. Why? Because everybody has dirt. We expect it in a political campaign. But here's Daniel, a political figure who they have looked into. They got the FBI, they got everybody that they can employ, and they are trying to find dirt on this man, and they cannot, and they hate him even more because he is so clean and righteous. They hate him, second of all, because he worships God. He is not a pagan. He does not embrace all world religions. He doesn't go around saying, you know, you worship the God of your choice, be he Allah or be he Buddha or be he whoever. You worship the one true God. And every day he bows down and he worships his covenant God. And they hate him for it. So they go off and they, they go and they tell the king that Daniel is over there worshiping like we have decreed. He cannot worship. And the sentence is you have to throw him into the lion's den. And so they coerce, so they force this king to follow through. And after they throw Daniel into the lion's den, they roll this great stone over the top. And they place a seal around it so that he cannot get out. The next morning, though, when they open it up, Daniel, he's okay. And the men who had thrown him in, they were thrown in, and they were eaten by the lions. And ironically, as the Bible often does, men were killed by their own devices. I think about Haman, who erects this gallows to kill Mordecai and gets hung on it himself. This sort of thing happens all the time in the Bible. The Bible has kind of a sense of humor. It's irony. As wicked men are killed by their own devices. Now I want to ask you, where have we seen something like this in the Bible before? Where have we seen the enemies of God conspiring to put to death an innocent man? An innocent man who was so righteous, men couldn't find anything wrong with him, but they hated him all the more just because of his righteousness. Where have we seen God's servant who represents his people, he is the leader of the people, in a very fervent prayer just prior to his death. Being arrested, it would seem, during or immediately after he has gone to God in prayer. Where is it that we've seen in the Bible God's servant, his leader, being fed to the lions, be it metaphorical? The Bible says, Psalm 22, verse 13, they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth. If you don't know who Psalm 22 is about, you ought to go home and read that psalm in its entirety. A beautiful psalm. Where have we seen a man of God sentenced to death in a mock trial presided over by a spineless ruler who will not oppose the people and uphold justice? Where have we seen a man placed, as if it were in his tomb, a stone roll over and sealed to make sure that he cannot escape? Where have we seen, when that occurred, that the enemies of God were destroyed by their own devices? There are a lot of similarities between Daniel and Jesus, but there's one stark difference. If Daniel died, it would, it would be as a witness to God. Yet notice what the Bible says, Daniel chapter 6, verse 21 then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. Because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. He says, the reason God didn't allow me to die is because I was innocent. Now I'm asking this question. Could Jesus not have said the same thing? Jesus said, I shouldn't have to die because I'm innocent, right? Jesus didn't die because he's innocent. He had to die because he was our replacement, because he was our atonement. If Daniel dies, he dies as a witness. He cannot die on behalf of the people. 
He cannot save the nation from their sins. Only Jesus can provide the atonement sacrifice. Jesus was innocent in every way like Daniel. He was hated for the same reasons. He gave God glory to the death to bring atonement into the world as God's representative of his people. Daniel 7, with Daniel's dream. Mentioned earlier, Daniel 7 is parallel with Daniel 2. In Daniel 2, you had this idol that represented four kingdoms. But in Daniel 7, Daniel has this dream of four beasts coming up out of the sea. There was a beast that looked like a lion with eagle's wings, representing the Babylonian kingdom. It was followed by a bear, representing the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by a leopard, representing the Grecian Empire, followed by the Roman Empire, who is a dreadful beast with ten horns, one of which spoke great blasphemies. This is the same vision. This is the vision from Earth's perspective. When the Earth looks at the kingdoms of men, they see glorious, worshipful kingdoms. A great idol that needs to be worshipped and revered. But when God looks upon them, he sees nasty beasts that have to be destroyed. In this vision, you also see God enthroned in his royal court. His servants are gathered around him and books are opened before him. This might sound familiar, for in Revelation chapter 1, you see God revealed in all of his glory. He is seated in the midst of his court in Revelation 4 and 5, and books are opened before him in Revelation 20 as beasts come up out of the sea, Revelation 13. Revelation borrows heavily from, from Daniel's visions. In the midst of these horrid beasts coming up, there is a scene of judgment as the Son of Man appears riding on the clouds. The clouds are his chariot. He's been to war. He is coming back from war and he is appearing before God for he has beaten the beasts. The Bible says there that an everlasting dominion was granted to him by the Father along with great glory. An everlasting kingdom that could not be destroyed and a people from all nations and tongues. And he sits down to reign with God at God's right hand. This is heaven's view of the stone that struck the image and grew into massive proportions. Now we'll talk more about this in just a second. But I want to pause here with our overview and notice what's going on. In the first layer, in Daniel 2 and 7, you have two kingdoms... And two kings being contrasted. The kingdoms of men will perish while the kingdom of God will grow in glory and splendor and power forever and ever. Never forget that. In the second layer, you have the remnant of God and the representative of God. They're placed on trial by human kingdoms. And God finds them innocent, and he reverses the verdict in a miraculous way to send a message to the whole world. And then he kind of turns the tables around. Here God's people are being tried. Now God puts the king on trial. He is willing to forgive if the human will humble himself. But when they refuse to, and they reach a point of what we would call no return... God passes final judgment because he's the ruler of the world. And what you have to get from Daniel 2 through 7, if you get nothing else, is this simple point. God rules over the world. And he does as he pleases. And there is nothing man can do about it. He stands with his faithful, and he will try the kingdoms of this world who have tried over and over and over again to destroy his kingdom. Now, 
I want to read two passages for you and we're done. Matthew 26, verse 62. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. What's he quoting from? He's quoting from Daniel 7. These men should have been able to realize this and recognize what Jesus is saying is, I am the Son of God. And though you have me on trial right now, this is how I gain the victory. I am mounting up for battle. And I am about to ascend to God on my cloud chariot to receive my kingdom with all authority. Now, from earthly perspective, that looks pretty foolish. Jesus is on trial. It looks like there's nothing he can do to escape, and they are going to kill him. They're going to do whatever they have to to kill him. And they think that they are gaining the victory. But Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. For through the cross... He gained the greatest victory that the world has ever seen as he triumphed over Satan in death. Satan was cast out and Jesus was lifted up for the glory of God as he purchased his kingdom. In Matthew 28, two chapters later, Jesus told his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Where did he get it? He received authority because he went to the Father and was given glory and authority. He was given a kingdom. And now as reigning king, he commissions the apostles to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. That's what Daniel was seeing happen. The kingdom established. All nations flowing into God's kingdom. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Never, ever, ever will the kingdom of God be destroyed. They may be persecuted. It may be chased from town to town. It may be beaten. It may be killed at times. But God's kingdom will not be destroyed. Though the kingdoms of this world will be judged been a very patient audience tonight. I'll say this, if you're here tonight and you have not obeyed the gospel, why, oh why, would you not bow down before King Jesus, confess his name to the glory of God, submit yourself to his reign to do whatever he has commanded, being baptized with him into his death, sharing his death. You want to be part of the remnant you have to identify with the leader. That means you have to share his suffering. At times on earth as a Christian, it looks like God's not reigning because the church is persecuted. But you always have to have the vision of faith. What's heaven's perspective? You think God's worried about COVID? You think God's trying to come up with a solution to the problem? You think God is concerned at all with what governments of this world say and do and laws that they enact? God reigns. And may his children in difficult times use difficulty as a refining moment to burn off Dross and to become purified for God's glory and honor. If you're not one of his children, part of the kingdom, why don't you become a member of the kingdom today? You are a child of God, but you have bowed the knee to God's rivals, or you have failed to worship God as he required. 
why don't you make that right with your king as we come as we sing.